Bonjour à tous. Good morning, everyone, from the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Haudenosaunee. This morning, I am joined by my colleagues, Ministers Monsaf, Sejan, and Garneau, to provide an important update on Canada's response to the situation in Afghanistan. The images coming out of Hamid Karzai International Airport in Kabul are shocking and profoundly tragic. It cannot be overstated how painful and distressing this moment is for those desperately trying to leave, as well as Afghan Canadians and veterans here at home. Even as the situation has deteriorated far more quickly than the coalition anticipated, Canada has ramped up our evacuation efforts. Bien qu'il y ait d'énormes difficultés sur le terrain en Afghanistan, ou même se rendre à l'aéroport est extrêmement dangereux, nous avons heureusement pu reprendre nos vols. Nous avions commencé les vols le 4 AU. Nous poursuivrons nos efforts pour aider les personnes à sortir d'Afghanistan jusqu'à ce que la situation à l'aéroport nous empêche de fonctionner en toute sécurité. By our latest count, We've evacuated 12 flights and a little more than 1,100 individuals. In the coming days, we're working tirelessly to build on those numbers. Flights have resumed. Our armed forces are back on the ground coordinating closely with our coalition partners, and boarding passengers are as quickly and as safely as possible while performing with great courage. We are working closely with the United States and other allies towards our shared objective of evacuating as many people as we can from Afghanistan. We have reached an airbridge agreement that allows Canadian-bound Afghans to board allied air carriers and, in turn, allied-bound Afghans to board Canadian planes. This means that Canada has the ability to leverage more evacuation capacity through the airbridge jointly established by the coalition. Minister Sejan will have more to say on our military operations. Within my department, our people are working around the clock. I've instructed that processing be accelerated, resources be added, and that all red tape be cut without compromising security. The requirements for passports and COVID testing put in place by the former Afghan government have been gone for some time. And now we've moved biometric screening outside of Afghanistan to other countries where it's safe, so refugees can get on planes even faster. Of course, we know that there are significant challenges traveling to the Kabul airport and getting into the airport itself. The Taliban controls the checkpoints, which makes getting this done perilous. In a call with my Five Eyes counterparts, we together stated our clear expectation that those wanting to leave Afghanistan should be given safe passage. As the operation continues, my department is staying in contact with those who've applied under our programs. We're offering as much information as we can on direction and guidance, on where and when to travel, and direct collaboration with our armed forces on the ground. We're also supporting Afghans in Canada who are anxious to be reunited with their families. IRCC is priority processing family reunification cases of citizens, permanent residents, and protected persons with immediate family members in Afghanistan. Likewise, the Immigration and Refugee Board is now prioritizing asylum claims from Afghanistan. Those approved will receive protected status and will be able to apply to sponsor their families as well. A little over two weeks ago, I had the honor of greeting the first group of newcomers as they stepped off the flight on the tarmac in Toronto along with my friend and colleague, Minister Monsef. The Afghans we met on the tarpa tarmac are now be beginning their new lives in Canada, and we know Canadians are going to support them. In fact, just a few days ago, 40 Afghan families finished their quarantine, becoming the very first refugees from this initiative to join their new communities. As refugees begin to leave their quarantine safely, we have more work to do on the home front for families like theirs. We're going to put all of our energy to implementing the humanitarian resettlement pathway, which will welcome refugees who fled Afghanistan, focusing on women, on girls, on journalists, human rights activists, and targeted minorities, including Afghan Sikhs, Hindus, and Hazaras. Canada was the first country in the world to in introduce this sort of program. And we've already begun convening the settlement community, international partners, and non-government organizations, and you're going to hear more about that soon. Nous avons des liens et des lignes de communication solides avec les provinces et les territoires, les municipalités et notre vaste réseau d'organismes d'établissements grâce à notre expérience de l'opération réfugiée syrienne. 
Nous sommes déjà passés par là et nous savons ce qu'il faut faire. Et plus important encore, nous avons déjà reçu de nombreuses offres de soutien de la part des personnes et d'organisations de tous les pays qui cherchent des moyens d'aider. Canadians are a compassionate people. I can't tell you how proud I am to see the wave of generosity swell. Everyone can contribute in their own way, as volunteers, as donors, as employers, as classmates, but most importantly, as neighbors and as friends. For those looking for ways to support the cause more directly, you can email Afghani Resettlement at ccislive.ca to connect with Canadian refugee resettlement agencies involved in the effort or contact your local service provider organization to offer your time, your words of welcome, and your support. For Canadians who can go even further in helping, I encourage you to consider our privately sponsored refugee program. Through the generosity of Canadians, hundreds of thousands of refugees have come to Canada as privately sponsored refugees. I know Canadians will step up once again as they did in Operation Syria. Nous faisons tout ce qui est en notre pouvoir pour que cette opération se déroule le plus rapidement et le plus sûrement possible. Tout mon département est saisi par l'urgence de la situation en Afghanistan. En ce moment même, des centaines d'employés des ici travaillant jour et nuit pour gérer un volume de plus de 17 000 courriels et pour communiquer avec les personnes évacuées. Nous tirons parti de la capacité de notre réseau mondial et de notre secteur opérationnel pour mettre davantage des personnes en sécurité et leur fournir le soutien et les services dont elles nous besoin pour commencer leur vie dans le nouveau pays. Je suis reconnaissant aux nombreuses mains et nombreux esprits qui participent à cet effort. As I conclude our remarks this morning, I want to leave you with this. When Minister Monsef and I greeted the first flight a few weeks ago, I had the privilege of meeting an expectant mother who was eight and a half months along. Well, on Friday, the day she was set to leave quarantine, she gave birth to a beautiful baby girl, the newest member of our Canadian family. We can't imagine the relief and hope that she's feeling for her child. It's for new beginnings like these that we are going to continue to do everything in our power to evacuate as many people as possible and save lives. I'd now like to turn things over to my friend and colleague, Minister Sejan, who will be providing an update for the Canadian Armed Forces. Thank you. Merci. Good morning. Bonjour à tous. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. Over 40,000 Canadian Armed Forces members served in Afghanistan during Canada's 13-year mission in the country. Those who served in Afghanistan formed deep connections and friendships with the Afghan people, and including myself. Now, many Canadians retain deep emotional bonds with Afghanistan, including the thousands of Afghan Canadians who are worried about their families and their friends. In particular, I want to thank the many veterans groups who have reached out to connect us to our former Afghan staff. Your, your support has been crucial and deeply appreciated now, everything for everything you have done to help us. Today, I want to provide an update on Canada's work to evacuate Canadians in Afghanistan and vulnerable Afghans, including those who worked with Canada. And because the situation on the ground is challenging and dynamic, we had Canadian Armed Forces um, members on the ground at our embassy, assisting and advising our ambassador since early this year. Now, since late July, the situation in Afghanistan deteriorated very quickly. Since July 30th, our defense team and Canadian Armed Forces members have been working tirelessly to evacuate Canadian citizens, permanent residents, and at-risk Afghan nationals. Now, to help evacuate these peoples, we have deployed um, the C-117 Globemasters, our Hercules aircraft, as well as Canadian Armed Forces personnel at Hamid, Hamid Karzai Interna uh, International Airport in Kabul. On August 4th, the first flight of Afghan refugees who assisted Canada arrived in Toronto. And the, rapids, uh, the rapid change in the security situation also meant that Global Affairs Canada had to stop operations at the Canadian Embassy in Kabul and quickly evacuate its, its staff. Now, members of the Canadian Armed Forces ensured their safe evacuation. I want to thank them for their bravery and courage. Now, thanks to you, our diplomatic personnel are out of harm's way and at home safely in Canada. 
And because the situation on the ground had worsened considerably, there was a short pause in evacuation flights in order to reestablish the Allied Air Bridge. However, Canada resumed evacuation flights on August 19th. Now, this flight evacuated 175 at-risk Afghans and 13 foreign nationals. All of these passengers have been transferred uh, to the care of our allies. Another Canadian flight on August uh, 20th departed Kabul, carrying 106 people, including Afghan nationals, Canadian citizens, and their families, and one permanent resident. We also brought out a number of allied military personnel. And yesterday, we evacuated over 121 people. This included Canadian citizens and their family members. Afghan nationals accepted for resettlement by Canada, and Afghan nationals accepted for resettlement by our allied partners. The 12 Canadian flights thus far have evacuated over 1,000 Afghan nationals. Now, these Afghans are considered to be the most at risk of Taliban retribution because of the work they did with Canada and allied countries. And I want to give Canadians a clear picture of what is happening on the ground right now. Like many Canadians, I've seen heartbreaking images and videos of the scene unfolding uh, around um, the airport. The security situation around the airport is making it increasingly difficult for people to get there. The area around the airport is intensely crowded and violence in the area is increasing. These problems remain a major challenge in getting people out of Afghanistan. Bringing Canadian citizens and Afghan nationals to Canada is our top priority, and I'm working night and day with Ministers Carnot, Mendicino, and Monsa. Canada is part of a 13-nation air bridge working together to evacuate as many of our citizens and vulnerable Afghans as possible. We are working with the U.S. and other allied partners to keep our planes and theirs constantly flying in and out of the airport. As part of this effort, Canadian Armed Forces flights are transporting service members, citizens, and refugees destined for Canada and other allied nations. And in turn, allied aircraft are transporting Canadian Armed Forces personnel, Canadian citizens, and others. And on the ground, our Canadian Armed Forces members have been working under difficult conditions to facilitate the entry of Canadians and, and Afghans destined for, destined for Canada into the, uh, into the airport and to ensure that they get on Canadian and allied planes. They're also working in direct contact with IRCC and Global Affairs Canada partners, advocacy groups, and, and local contacts to assist Canadians and Afghans destined for Canada in assessing the Kabul airport. In order to evacuate as many people as possible, the schedule for flight departures and landing is very tight. When Canadian planes land in Kabul, Canadian Armed Forces members board as many passengers as they can then the plane must depart within its scheduled window. On Canadian flights, loads have been at the maximum amount possible within the safety and capability parameters. And I want to be clear that we have empowered Canadian Armed Forces personnel on the ground to make decisions around aircraft capacity in the interest of saving lives. Canadian flights will continue evacuating people from Kabul for as long as it is safe to do so. Alongside our partners, I and the Department of National Defense and the Canadian Armed Forces are working to bring Canadians and at-risk Afghans to safety as quickly as possible. Now, this is a worrying, worrying time. We know that the conditions are dangerous and the images that we are seeing are heartbreaking. But I want to let Canadians know this, that our Canadian Armed Forces members will continue to do everything everything they can to evacuate Canadians and Afghans seeking as a safer and better life. And when they get here, we will do everything we can to support their future and their new home. We will continue working around the clock to evacuate Canadians and Afghans, pr protecting people and saving lives. This is our promise and our commitment. Thank you, Merci Boku. And I'll, now I'll turn it over to Minister Garneau. Thank you very much, uh, Harjit, and thank you for joining us this morning for an update on Canada's response to this crisis in Afghanistan. The stories coming out of Kabul are heartbreaking. People are scared, they fear for their lives, and they're taking significant risks to try to get to safety. 
The panic we see in emails and hear during phone calls really drives home the gravity of the situation. We are walking this difficult road with them, helping them step by step to get to safety. Our goal is clear. It is to evacuate as many Canadians and vulnerable Afghans as possible for as long as the security situation will allow, whether in Afghanistan or in a third country for those who manage to leave on their own. We are coordinating our efforts with allies to get as many people out of Afghanistan as we can. Our consular officials at Global Affairs Canada are working around the clock with officials from National Defence and IRCC to respond to Canadian and Afghan citizens who urgently need our help. Our officials are processing requests for evacuation assistance as fast as possible and staying in regular communications with Canadians looking to leave Afghanistan. Comme vous pouvez l'imaginer, il y a des défis à relever dans un environnement aussi instable. La situation sécuritaire autour de l'aéroport international de Kaboul s'est dégradée. L'aéroport est extrêmement achalandé. Il y a eu des incidences de violence. Les talibans ont érigé plusieurs postes de contrôle sur les routes qui mènent à l'aéroport et tout déplacement dans la ville est dangereux. À ceux qui se trouvent en Afghanistan, nous recommandons de ne pas vous rendre à l'aéroport avant qu'on vous contacte pour un vol. Utilisez votre jugement pour décider si vous devez rester où vous êtes ou vous rendre dans un endroit plus sécuritaire. Restez dans un endroit sûr et ne faites pas de voyages dangereux sans savoir s'il si y a une place sur un vol. Communiquez avec Affaires mondiales Canada pour plus de renseignements. Vous pouvez écrire à sos.international.gc.ca. Nous apprenons également que certains Canadiens ont réussi à se rendre dans un pays tiers, que ce soit sur des vols exploités par nos alliés ou par d'autres moyens. Nous leur fournirons une assistance consulaire où qu'ils se trouvent. Nous avons demandé à nos missions de se tenir prêtes à les aider. Pendant ce temps, nous continuons de condamner la violence en Afghanistan et nous restons déterminés à soutenir le peuple afghan dans le respect de ses droits et de sa sécurité, surtout les femmes et les filles. Notre priorité est d'assurer la sécurité des Canadiens et des résidents permanents et de les ramener chez eux. Nous n'arrêterons pas tant que nous ne pourrons pas les ramener en sécurité. Merci et je passe le microphone maintenant à notre collègue, la ministre Mansef. Thank you, Mark. Hello, bonjour, Anine. Salam alaikum. Ve salam mersus. Be dustano azizana afghan tabar be Canada ve dar sarasar dunya. I'm speaking to you from my home in Peterborough, Kawartha, on Michisagi Anishinaabe territory, and I'd like to begin by thanking the Prime Minister for his leadership, for prioritizing the people of Afghanistan, and for assigning this hardworking team to this difficult work. It is a difficult time. We are glued to our screens, as Afghan diaspora are across the globe and in Afghanistan, as we watch hour by hour developments and horror unfold. It's bringing back memories for me, and I think for all of us, of the times our families were huddled around radios in a not too distant past, waiting for the war to start, waiting for the war to end, wondering what's happened to our loved ones. My promise to you is, Canada's Minister for Women and Gender Equality, and as the only Afghan Canadian in Parliament, is this. First and foremost, I will work with our colleagues here and around the world to ensure we create space for the voices of Afghan women and girls and minorities. Their voices must be heard. They must shape Canada's response and the global response. They are the most at risk from the ideology and the behavior of Taliban, 
and I will continue to raise their voices in international conversations, including at the upcoming G20 summit. The Taliban are the same Taliban of 20 years ago. A legitimate government would immediately allow for the safe passage of all on Afghan soil. A legitimate government would immediately seize the, seize the violence, the femicide, the genocide, the rapes, the looting, and a legitimate government would, ret would return immediately to an inclusive peace negotiation that includes women and minorities in a meaningful way. I also commit this, that our government will continue to engage with Afghan Canadians. We will keep you updated and ensure that our response is in line with what you're hearing and what you envision, that you play a key role in the resettlement efforts underway as Canadians have stepped up during Operation Syria, we will continue to show the world what it's like to open our arms and our hearts to those who are in distress and need our help. The Prime Minister's requested that we work around the clock on this, so that in a year from now, in 10, 20, 50 years from now, we can all look back on this moment and say, we did everything we could. As you can see, my colleagues here have been working hard, as have their teams. Some thousand Afghans have arrived on Canadian soil, including a baby girl born this weekend. They'll be starting a new life here, and they will give back to Canada and to their sisters and brothers back home. These are painful times. A nightmare is replaying itself. And Canada will continue to be there to do our part. But remember, this is not the Afghanistan of 20 years ago. International partners and Canadians made a lot of progress and built deep ties and strong understanding of my ancestral land. Because of that hard work, mothers and babies live longer. The society itself is experiencing culture change with more educated girls and boys across the country. Women have succeeded in exceptional ways. There are more Afghan women in parliament than there are more women in parliament here in Canada. And there is a generation of women in Afghanistan and around the world. We watched our mothers resist the Taliban. We listened to them and we stayed in school. We made something of our lives and we are all over the world, amplifying and mobilizing. We recognize that the horrors unfolding are triggering veterans and Afghans and anyone who's worked hard to make sure there is progress in Afghanistan. My request to you is this, take good care of yourselves, check in on each other. The road ahead is hard and unpredictable. We need you to be well so that we can continue the fight that our mothers started. Tashakor, merci, miigwech. Over to you, Alex. Thank you, Minister. We will now begin the press conference portion of the event. On commence par maintenant la conférence de presse. If media have questions, please uh, indicate so on the line, and I will turn it over to the, op to the operator for our first question. Maintenant, je passe la parole please, pour notre première question. Thank you. Merci. Please press star one at this time if you have a question. S'il vous plaît, appuyez sur étoile un maintenant pour poser votre question. Questions will be taken only from the media, and please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. Seules les questions des médias seront prises, et nous vous prions de vous limiter à une question et une question de suivi. The first question, la première question, is from Lisa Laflamme of CTV News. Please proceed. Yes, good morning, and thank you so much for taking our questions today. Uh, the Afghan families that we are tracking received uh, a text yesterday to proceed to the airport on their own. Then they were told not to go. 
There were several texts back and forth, complete confusion. Uh, there were no buses, no Canadian soldiers, no military escorts to get them there safely to the airport, as France managed to do. I wonder why not, and is there a plan for Canadian forces to go outside the wire to help these people successfully and safely get to the Kabul airport? No, thank you very much uh, for that question, Lisa. Um, one thing I can assure you, our Canadian Armed Forces members are doing everything in their power, looking at every opportunity um, uh, to be able to support and get Afghans um, uh, to the Air Force. For operational security reasons, for obvious reasons, I cannot divulge the situation, um, what the, exactly what our troops are doing. But one thing I can say, they have all the flexibility uh, to be able to make uh, the appropriate decisions um, so they can take the actions. The security situation on the ground is all uh, changing rapidly, literally, sometimes literally by the hour. But one thing I can assure you, I can assure you that they are doing everything in their power and, and taking every opportunity, but I can't get into any more details at the risk of compromising uh, their great work. The people we've been speaking to in constant contact got to that airport. There was no Canadian representation whatsoever. In fact, they were told, wait, we'll go get somebody. And no Canadian representation ever arrived after an eight-hour precarious wait at that airport. So I understand, obviously, operational security, but what is the plan? What is the information we can pass along to our Afghan families that are targeted because of their connection to this country? What do we tell them today? I mean, I'll take the first portion of, of the question and um, um, pass it over to uh, Mr. Mandicino in terms of the selection of, of the people. But one thing I can assure you, we do have uh, Canadian Armed Forces personnel at all um, uh, the gates. Uh, and they have uh, done some very creative and interesting work to be able to connect with people um, and guiding them. And this is one of the reasons we have been able to uh, save many uh, Canadian citizens and um, Afghans. The, uh, the situation on the ground is extremely chaotic and, and difficult um, uh, to identify. But one thing I can I assure you, the members are doing um, a tremendous work. For like I said, for obvious reasons, um, I can't provide uh, further details. But I can assure you, not only that they that they are uh, doing their work, but they're also working with our allies and taking every opportunity to figure out how they can get um, Afghans into and close to the air, uh, airport. And I'll, I'll just very, I'll just very, I'll just very quickly add to that uh, that uh, you're quite right, Lisa. The situation on the ground is volatile. It's dangerous. It's rapidly evolving. And as Minister Sejan uh, indicated, uh, all of our forces have the full operational discretion to take whatever actions are necessary to get as many people into uh, the airport and onto those flights as quickly as possible. And in the meanwhile, I just want to assure you that we are remaining in constant contact with everybody that has applied under our programs, giving them as much direction with regards to where and when and how to stay safe as possible. And we will exhaust every effort uh, to continue to process those applications. Uh, as quickly as possible. Um, IRCC is working 24-7 on this and will continue to do so, and our armed forces will take whatever actions they can and are necessary to get them on those planes. Two minutes. Thank you. We'll now go to the next question. I'll pass it now to the prochaine question. Operator. Thank you. The next question, the uh, question suivante, is from Akrit Michael of the Toronto Star. Please proceed. Hi, good morning, and thank you for taking questions today. Uh, an IRCC spokesperson told the Star yesterday that the government's special humanitarian program will focus on resettling Afghan nationals who are outside of Afghanistan and don't have another stable option for protection. Uh, what does this mean for the thousands in Kabul desperately looking to get out? 
Well, first, uh, Canada was the first country in the world to announce a humanitarian resettlement program of this kind, focusing on women, girls, and targeted minorities, uh, particularly women, uh, as I said, but also uh, the Afghan Sikhs, uh, Hindus, and Hazars. So we were first out of the gate on that. But I also want to assure you and uh, everyone that is listening in uh, that we have put in place the operational flexibility that is required so that we can save as many Afghans as possible. And in close coordination, not only with with my colleague, Minister Sejan, the Canadian Armed Forces, but equally uh, with our allied partners. Uh, what we have done is we have increased our evacuation capacity so that more Canadian-bound Afghans, whether they are part of our uh, original special immigration program or may indeed qualify under our humanitarian program, can get on those flights. And obviously, we'll continue to, uh, to respond as the situation dictates. And may I just add, for the case where um, Afghans have left the country to a neighboring country, as I mentioned in my remarks, uh, the Canadian consulates or embassies in the neighboring countries are ready to process those Afghans who will qualify under the special immigration measures. They're all ready to do that as soon as there is contact between the Afghans and the consulate or embassy. Yes, thank you. Um, your government has in the past started out with a base number of refugees you will accept, but has gone on to end up crossing that figure. Uh, in 2016, you initially promised to settle 25,000 Syrian refugees, but Canada has till date taken in almost double that number in the last five years. Is there a possibility that that same trend may apply in the case of this Afghan crisis as well? Um, is there a margin to be able to potentially go over that figure of 20,000? Canada is known as being a, a shining example of how to do humanitarian resettlement. Uh, year after year, uh, we have been the uh, most the largest recipient of refugees from around the world. Uh, and I would uh, point out and highlight that for years, we have indeed been a safe haven uh, for Afghan refugees. Uh, we will continue to show that leadership, uh, which is to say that as the humanitarian crisis unfolds, we're going to keep a very open mind about what it is that we need to do to save as many lives as possible. Um, we've put in place special immigration measures to help those Afghans who supported the Canadian mission. Uh, we've announced a, a groundbreaking humanitarian resettlement program that will help uh, those who are both in Afghanistan right now, but also uh, increasingly and after the evacuation operation concludes, those who've had to uh, flee Afghanistan. And we will uh, do whatever it takes to continue to show leadership on this front, working closely with civil society, community organizations, advocates, and ordinary Canadians who, as we have seen time and time again, are prepared to step up. I'll go to the next question. I'll pass on to the next question. Operator. Thank you. Merci. La prochaine question. The next question is from Jim Bronskill of the Canadian Press. Please proceed. Good morning. Uh, what exactly are you doing to get women and LGBTQ people out of Kabul? Um, the focus is on ter interpreters, many of whom are men, and uh, many of of course, need help, but Canada says it has a feminist foreign policy. So why are we not seeing it in action right now? Well, I'm going to answer the first part of that, and then I'd like to turn it over to Minister Monsef. But you're quite right. Under our special immigration measures, we put focus on locally engaged staff and interpreters. But the other thing that we did was we took a very broad and inclusive approach in defining their families, which means that uh, we'll be able to uh, put that focus on women, on dependents, on little children. And when it comes to implementing our third country resettlement program, um, we have uh, already said that the focus will be on women and girls, human rights activists, and targeted minorities, and our department uh, will ensure that we are, um, we are screening for applications that, that prioritize those individuals. And I will turn it now to, uh, to my colleague, Minister Monsef. Thank you, Marco. That's exactly right. In addition to the work that we're doing in alignment with Canada's feminist international assistance policy, uh, we're listening closely to, uh, for example, 
Afghan women parliamentarians who are still representatives of their constituents. We're staying connected with CSOs, uh, non-governmental organizations on the ground and here in Canada, because as the Taliban have succeeded, women are essentially invisible right now. Moreover, we are working with our international partners, and every time we have a conversation with our global partners, we make sure that we are advocating for women and girls, LGBT folks, Hazaras, Shias, uh, Sikhs and Hindus, minorities in Afghanistan, to be part of the conversation and to be counted. We will have more to say on that in the coming days. And if I can just add to that. I just also want to stress, um, I mean, we have our Special Forces troops doing tremendous work on, on the ground, but these are also Canadians who have families. Um, they have served in Afghanistan, seen the atrocities that, that have taken place. And, uh, um, and Minister Monsef uh, and um, Medicino also know the conversations we've had so that we, that, about giving our troops the flexibility to make the choices when they see vulnerable Afghans, especially women and girls, to be able to identify them very quickly and get them into uh, to the airport and to safety. And that's the flexibility that our troops have on the ground to be able to carry that out. Well, uh, follow up. Uh, also, uh, given the lack of refueling capacity with uh, the C 17s, why isn't Canada enlisting uh, commercial airlines, such as Air Canada, to, to fly planes from, say, Dubai or other regional places to help out uh, now that the Americans are thinking of turning to commercial airlines as well? Well, first of all, I'll take the first portion of that question. Um, what our plan is we have been bringing Canadians back, to, uh, direct, sorry, uh, Afghans directly back to Canada. And, and we're able to resettle and provide this, the, the support here. Um, uh, the, uh, the third location, I know that they are filling up, and hence the U.S. is making various decisions uh, to making sure that uh, they're able to move uh, people out from that so they can continue to bring, bring more people in. But this is that coordination that is taking place within our allies. I have a call later today with um, uh, the U.S. Secretary of Defense on a number of topics, including... Uh, uh, this one. But the, the air bridge is established so that all of us uh, can take part in this, so that no one gets um, a certain priority. We can have, we have access to all uh, the aircrafts and the plans and decisions that we make is to support all our efforts. And that's the best way to making sure that we get as many uh, vulnerable Afghans to safety. La prochaine question est de Marie-Isabelle Rochon of Radio-Canada. Please proceed. Oui, bonjour. Euh, J'aimerais qu'on nous parle, bien, premièrement, en fran les réponses en français. Euh, Qu'en est-il de la réunification des familles? Euh, Est-ce qu'il y a un bon programme de parrainage qui est organisé? Si c'est possible de nous répondre en français, s'il vous plaît. Oui, merci pour euh, la question. Et, euh, nous avons lancé quelques initiatives pour euh, prioriser euh, le euh, les processus de la réunification de les familles. Euh, premièrement, euh, comme j'avais déjà dit, euh, euh, dans le, le contexte de les mesures, mesures spéciales que nous avons lancées euh, il y a euh, presque un mois, euh, il y a une définition de familial, à famille euh, qui est qui est très inclusif euh, pour euh, le but de de porter euh, les familles avec euh, les interprétaires euh, les autres euh, personnes qui avaient soutenu euh, euh, le, le mission Canada, de Canada en Afghanistan euh, au même temps Ici, pour euh, les Afghans qui sont déjà arrivé au Canada, nous continuons de prioriser leur, euh, leur processus. Et euh, même pour euh, les personnes qui, euh, qui avaient un, une application avant le tribunal euh, d'immigration et réfugiés, euh, ils avons euh, annoncé qu'il qu a, qu a lancé une initiative pour prioriser euh, cette personne-là. Euh, donc, après, ils sont euh, approuvés. 
ils peuvent uh, sponsorer uh, leur famille, uh, famille. Donc, il y a uh, plusieurs des, 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 des initiatives pour mettre une priorisation pour uh, le but de réunir uh, le, le plus grand nombre de familles. Madame Rochon, avez-vous une question de suivi? Allô? Peut-être vous êtes sordaine. Allô? <rire> Allô, Marco? Allô? Oui. Je suis là. Allô? Oui. OK. Oui. <rire> Hier, on a, on a entendu un témoignage d'un citoyen canadien qui est en Afghanistan. Il a reçu cinq fois un courriel pour se rendre à un certain point. Est-ce qu'il dépla... il, il a jamais réussi là Ce qu'il déplore, c'est vraiment ce manque d'organisation et le danger également pour sa vie et la vie de sa famille. Euh, Qu'est-ce que vous répondez à ça mais écoute, euh, la situation sur le terrain en Afghanistan est très dangereuse, très volatile et euh, il faut que nous restons en contact avec euh, eux qui, euh, qui euh, avaient assumé une application avec euh, l'RCC. Euh, il y a des lignes de communication, on communique avec des courriels, euh, aussi euh, nous communiquons euh, communique, pardon, avec euh, des appels directement et sur le terrain avec les membres de nos forces, euh, il y avait tout la discrétion euh, pour prendre des décisions efficaces pour porter euh, eux dans l'aéroport, pour mettre eux sur euh, l'aéroplane euh, dans un, un manière qui est, qui est efficace et avec en, en sécurité. Et peut-être euh, je peux passer la parole maintenant à, à, à le ministre Garneau euh, pour, euh, pour ajouter quelques, quelques autres choses sur cette question. Merci. Oui, bien, juste pour dire que euh, se rendre à l'aéroport et, et d'avoir un siège pour un vol qui sort, c'est pas comme aller à, à l'aéroport Trudeau en ce moment pour prendre un vol normal. La situation est très périlleuse et euh, ce qu'on essaie de planifier le plus possible, c'est de contacter les gens qui ont une place sur un avion qui euh, sera là pour une planche euh, pendant une, une planche horaire très, très serrée et que entre temps euh, entre le voyage qui se fait de leur, euh, de leur domicile à Kaboul jusqu'à l'aéroport, la situation peut changer en termes de sécurité parce que c'est tellement volatile et que c'est pour ça que c'est beaucoup plus difficile d'assurer que quand quelqu'un est contacté, qu'ils vont automatiquement pouvoir se rendre rapidement à l'aéroport, rentrer dans l'aéroport, prendre le vol, parce que la situation change constamment. On fait de notre mieux pour les aider à se rendre à l'aéroport pour prendre ce vol, mais on ne peut pas garantir, étant donné la situation qui change continuellement, euh, on ne peut pas garantir euh, que ça ne va pas changer. Mais on fait de notre mieux pour essayer euh, de leur assurer euh, un un siège sur le vol. Merci. Maintenant, la prochaine question. Merci. 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 What are some of the specific challenges and potential risks with the military going outside the wire to bring people to the airport by bus or, for example, helicopter? I, w I wish I can give you certain more details. Um, I need, we need to make sure that we give, uh, keep, uh, uh, give our, allow our troops to be able to operate in a safe environment. It is, it is a... Uh, I have to be very careful with what I say um, and uh, on, on what they're doing, even the, the possibility of doing something, because you never know when an opportunity may come up and an action that they might have to uh, take. Um, I can tell you that we um, have a number of initiatives that we are using, looking at many uh, other options. Uh, we are not le we're looking we're, we're we're not discounting anything. Um, Uh, on what we need to do. The security situation is extremely uh, dire right now. But having said this, there have been many, many 
opportunities of hope where people are Canadian Armed Forces have been able to get Canadian citizens, Afghan nationals uh, to safety. And every single time they've taken that opportunity, they weigh the risk. And when they take that risk, um, every single one of our troops on the ground, including with our allies, um, are in a dangerous situation. But they know that the work that they're doing is about saving lives. They've done that in many other situations, and I can assure you this is very personal uh, to them. Um, and they will do everything in their power uh, to get as many people out. We have seen, you know, times when we've had the tremendous success stories, and it's also been heartbreaking when you've been uh, doing something and you end up in a situation where they get to the last televent checkpoint and not able to get through. So these are the situations that they're dealing with, and as much as how difficult it is for us to see those images, they're witnessing this directly. And when, and I can assure you that motivates them even more to look at every single possibility. And I, but I can assure you that they have all the resources necessary to carry out um, this mission. There's a reason why we have sent um, our, our special forces on the ground because they have the training, the ability uh, to take opportunities. But we want to do it in a safe manner, not just for them, but also uh, for the safety of the people that we're trying to uh, help as well. Why are working our forces? And as well, um, IRC, for, for those that are outside the gate that are being told by Canada to arrive and show up for flights, they're being told to yell Canada, which in some cases they say is making them a target to the Taliban. They don't see any Canadian Armed Forces in their view outside the gate. Um, and some of them say that they have been lashed by the Taliban while waiting, being told to go to the lines. One person camped out with their family, they told us, for days, finally got to the front of the line. And the Taliban, they said, turned them away and turned away those IRCC documents. What exactly... Are, what exactly what, do you want to say to those people who are stuck outside the gate right now, who are so close but cannot get in? Specifically, what should they be doing to increase their odds? So first of all, well, I'll, just take the, I'll take the question uh, for, on the, the, uh, on the uh, different direction that is given. One thing I can assure you that anything that the Canadian Armed Forces personnel uh, are using, they're keeping it confidential and, and uh and they've been very creative with this. I know that there have been um, uh, uh, suggestions from different groups and communication going to various groups, because I have um, uh, heard this my, my, myself. And, uh, and so it does in, um, increase the, uh, the danger level uh, for the people on the ground. But to, so this is why we need to trust our folks when they communicate with them. They're communicating with them on how, not only where to go, what the communication need, need, need to be. And it's only through them and the instructions that they provide is what uh, our, um, uh, our Afghans should be uh, listen, listening to. And I can assure you again, they have been very creative uh, in those ways, and they have had some tremendous success. But we, I know that we're having a lot of help from various uh, groups uh, and trying to give um, uh, various advice. And, and all that is useful, but it also adds uh, sometimes confusion as well. And all that communication, I can assure you, is being communicated directly by our folks on the ground to the individuals, and they have different, different ways of identifying people as well, and they'll continue to find more creative ways, ways as well. And I'll turn it over to Mr. Manichino. Uh, thanks, and uh, thank you for the question, Ashley. And I would just add to what Minister Sajan around um, our armed forces who are performing admirably uh, in exceedingly dangerous circumstances uh, that with, with with regards to what we are doing at IRCC, we are processing around the clock. Um, I've instructed my debar department to make this our number one priority and to remove all of the red tape, waiving usual requirements around passports and testing and deferring biometric screening and making sure that we continue to communicate constantly uh, with those who've applied under our programs. We're going to exhaust every single effort to ensure that they can transit to the airport, get into the airport, and then get on those planes uh, as for as long as we possibly can. Thanks, Ashley. We'll now go to the next question. I'll pass the question. Question, operator. Merci. Thank you. The next question is from Alan Salama, my second home TV. Please proceed. 
Thank you. With the current situation and critical challenges uh, at Kabul Airport right now, and uh, with the deferment of uh, biometric uh, uh, screening and whatever, how you make sure that there are no terrors uh, being evacuated and uh, they end up in Canada like what happened before? Uh, well, well, first of all, we have very rigorous screening in this country, and it's uh, based on the work that is done not only by my department, uh, but as well by my colleague, Minister Blair, uh, who, uh, who has uh, public safety uh, within his purview. Uh, but I also want to be abundantly clear that uh, the members who are on the ground right now are taking decisions in an extremely volatile uh, situation where uh, security uh, is rapidly unfolding. Uh, but they have the professional expertise to uh, be able to get those folks onto planes where we can remove them to uh, safer locations where the rest of that screening is done. Uh, and I have seen, and we I think collectively we have all seen, uh, the fruits of that hard labor in the arrival of uh, the first Afghan refugees uh, on a tarmac in Toronto. And that work will continue. As we said at the outset of this uh, press availability, um, we have seen already 12 flights uh, come out of Afghanistan with uh, 1,100 evacuated, and that work will continue for as long as possible. And it will be done safely and securely. And the follow-up for uh, Mr. Monsef. Uh, Ms. Monsef, as uh, an Afghan Canadian yourself and as a minister, what's your message uh, to some groups, including members of uh, Muslim Brotherhood in Canada and the world, who claim that Taliban is just fighting for their country, beliefs, and their religion? Well, I'm listening to Afghans here in Canada, Afghans on the ground in Afghanistan, Afghans who've been forced to leave their beloved homes, and they're not saying what our brothers are saying. What these women particularly are telling us is they're afraid of the hard-won gains of the past two decades being lost. They're telling us that there are armed men outside of their homes. They're sending us pictures. They're waiting for them to come out of their homes. They're telling us that if we turn our backs on them, Afghanistan will revert back to dangerous ways of treating women, girls, and minorities. If these brothers want to be considered as legitimate, here's what a legitimate force would do. First and foremost, allow for the safe passage of any individual on Afghan soil in and out of the country. Second, stop with the violence, stop with the femicides and the genocides, stop forcing their 11-year-old daughters to marry your fighters. Stop with the oppression of Shias and Hazaras, Hindus and Sikhs, and return immediately to the peace table in an inclusive way, in good faith, include women and minorities in a meaningful way, and show that you actually want to govern Afghanistan and that your mandate is not to oppress and to kill. Thank you, Minister. We will now go to the phone for our final question. I'm on that now, and the question final operator. Thank you. Merci. A dernière question. The last question is from Yasmin Yayat of Radio Canada Montréal. Please proceed. La parole est à vous. Oui. Bonjour. Alors, si possible d'obtenir une réponse en français. Um, C'est déjà très difficile pour les hommes de se rendre à l'aéroport de Kaboul. Alors, comment est-ce que vous comptez assurer la sécurité des femmes et des filles qui sont aussi des personnes en situation de vulnérabilité afin de leur permettre, d'une part, de se rendre à l'aéroport, d'être évacuées et aussi, qu'est-ce que vous avez prévu pour les prendre en charge ici lorsqu'elles pourront arriver au Canada? Uh. Euh, merci pour euh, la question. Nous resterons en contact avec toutes les personnes, euh, même les femmes et les petites filles euh, qui, euh, qui veulent euh, quitter l'Afghanistan euh, dans nos, nos programmes. Euh, il y a plusieurs de, de courriels. Nous restons en contact avec des, des, des appels. Et euh, il faut, quand il arrive, euh, euh, continuer ce travail en étroite collaboration avec 
tous les organismes euh, qui, avec, euh, qui, qui avaient le leadership euh, des femmes euh, sur euh, cet organisme pour, euh, pour commencer le, le processus de ce, l'intégration et de réinstaller euh, cet euh, cette réfugié euh, avec un focus pour, euh, pour, euh, pour les femmes et les petits filles. La sécurisation au fait, de l'entrée de l'aéroport de Kaboul, j'ai pu parler à, à, à certains interprètes qui se rendent tous les jours à l'aéroport. On sait maintenant que vaut mieux ne pas s'y rendre, mais est-ce que vous allez mettre des ressources Parce que ce que ces gens-là me disent sur le terrain, c'est qu'ils n'ont une fois arrivé devant la porte de l'aéroport de Kaboul qui leur est destinée, ils ne trouvent personne pour s'occuper de l'identification, de leur identification. Est-ce que vous avez déjà des ressources sur place Combien il y a de personnes pour justement vérifier les listes que vous avez et est-ce que vous comptez mettre au poster des membres des forces de l'armée canadienne à l'entrée de l'aéroport? Je vais passer la parole à, à le ministre Garneau et à, à Sejan dans un instant, mais je veux seulement dire que la situation euh, sur le terrain est très dangereuse, très volatile. Ça, c'est la raison que nous restons en contact avec euh, toutes les personnes qui veulent euh, quitter l'Afghanistan euh, pour euh, offrir la di direction euh, euh, pour, euh, pour euh, le temps et la location, euh, mais aux causes de... Euh, les, euh, les, les sensibles de, de l'opération. Euh, nous ne pouvons pas partager partageons, pardon, tous les détails, mais euh, dans, dans mon département, on continue de, de mettre tous nos ressources euh, sur ce euh, projet. C'est notre première euh, priorité. Et euh, maintenant, je vais euh, passer la parole à le ministre Garneau. Oui, merci, mais je pense que ce serait mieux que le ministre Sajjan s'adresse à cette question particulière. Merci. Merci. Um, uh, the whether it's uh, interpreters, vulnerable um, uh, members, and especially women and girls to be identified and brought inside. So there is a significant challenge. I wish it was easy as coming to a gate and to be able to put your hand up to go through, but this the security situation unfortunately just does not allowing uh, for that. But we have uh, Canadian Forces members at every gate. On sometimes the U.S. has make a decision just temporarily to having to close the gate for security uh, uh, reasons. But I can assure you, every single time those gates are open, we have Canadian Armed Forces personnel um, uh, there. Plus, they are also communicating in creative ways to be able to uh, uh, guide uh, people to them, and at the same time to be able to identify them as well. Thank you, Minister. Merci, Monsieur le Ministre. Je suis maintenant à la conférence de presse. This concludes our press conference for today. Happy Sunday, everyone.